Okay. Um, now uh, let's kick off the uh, IM and VRI construction session of the, um, the, the 15th uh, design conference. So time to start um, the special session one. So after the opening remarks of uh, Audrey Tan, and then that's followed by a Q&A style discussion. So first, um, I would like to introduce two panelists. So first panelist is uh, from Tohoku University. Um, and so the Professor Fumihiko Imamura uh, specializes in tsunami engineering at the uh, Tohoku University. He's going to join online. So please uh, give him a big round of applause. So he, uh, he specialized in the fluid wave motion numerical computation of the disaster science of uh, tsunami, history seismic wave traces investigation outside, inside and outside the country, and evacuation simulation, a cognitive psychology that analyzes the memory at the time of the refuge and human action, etc., and, and the tracking the research in uh, connection with tsunami disaster prevention. And he's also the forum aid advisor. Uh, very pleased to meet you. Thank you very much. And the, uh, the second panelist uh, is the uh, Professor Edwin R. Gavilla uh, from um, a fire safety engineering group of the uh, University of Greenwich. He's joining online. So give him a big round of applause, please. Professor Gallia is the founder of the Fire Safety Engineering Group, FSEG, of the University of Greenwich, the UK. And this is the place where the highly accurate evacuation analysis software, uh, Exodus, was developed. It is also a major source of many prominent papers and published works regarding evacuation analysis, uh, while also um, staring numerous times in major companies such as BBC and ABC. So, uh, Mr. Gallia, uh, welcome. And the moderator um, is uh, the Mr. Yota Ieiri. Uh, please come up to the, to the stage. So, a big round of applause for him, please. So um, he is an enthusiastic architectural IT journalist who transmits the latest news and information on his blog to provide proposals or solutions using beam, eye construction, and IoT to solve many business challenges that the uh, construction industry often faces, such as the uh, productivity growth, global environmental protection, and the, um, the internationalization. And he said he um, listened to you 24-7 and he keeps himself so busy for consulting and also the lecture giving. Now, uh, we uh, would like to ask uh, for uh, uh, Prime Minister, Minister Tam to join us, uh, and I uh, will ask her, her opening remarks. I ask her uh, uh, to join online today. Please give him a Give her big hands. The Audrey Tan uh, is uh, uh, the, the, the playing the role in the, the Taiwan National Development Commission and uh, uh, in private area uh, in Apple Company. He, he um, she was working as a consultant. Uh, <coughs> And, and so, uh, with social ethics, uh, he, she is working in, as uh, the uh, curriculum uh, member. The award uh, is uh, uh, active. He is uh, focusing on the, the government zero. That's a social. Uh, realizing a creation tool. Mr. Uh, Minister Tan, would you please join us? 
the local time, everyone. This is Audrey Tang, Taiwan's digital minister in charge of social innovation. It is my great pleasure and honor to be here virtually and share some thoughts with you about Taiwan's digital democracy. But first, as digital minister of Taiwan, I suppose it makes sense for me to travel digitally uh, across the time zone and talk to you. However, I believe uh, many of you would also agree when I say it is a pity that the pandemic made it difficult for me to join you in person because I remember the time before the pandemic when I traveled to Tokyo, Kyoto and many beautiful cities. Uh, before the pandemic, I had an opportunity to have face-to-face -face discussions with so many top-notch experts and scholars and shook hands, which is a pre-pandemic thing, uh, with friends from all over the world. And so as the COVID-19 pandemic threw the world off balance and brought drastic changes, we've seen symptoms uh, around many parts of the world of democracy and the trust in democracy in backslide. Some authoritarian regimes have tried to justify measures of state restrictions in the name of public health. And of course, there is never an easy way to tackle emerging disasters and challenges, but I see opportunities arise among the biggest global crises of our time. So when we are faced with this shared challenge in Taiwan in particular, I see digital social innovation continue to accelerate democracy and deepen the collaboration across sectors. And uh, so how do we start to bring ourselves to work with the people, not just for the people? Well, for me, the answer is really simple, is to trust our citizens, because to give no trust is to get no trust. And that is why in Taiwan, we have dedicated ourselves to bring technology into the spaces where citizens are, rather than expect citizens to adapt to the creations of the technologists. Our contact tracing system, 1922 SMS, is a case in point. It's a solution proposed not by the government, by the civic tech community, G0 VGov0, to ensure both privacy protection and efficient contact tracing. When we face our real first and only wave in May, which is you know, gone now in the past couple of months, we've had zero confirmed cases, uh, essentially. But in May, the GovZero community, the decentralized group of civic technologists, swung into action. And they enthusiastically discussed how to improve existing registration systems. And inspired by their discussions, uh, we did not use any app at all. You just use your built-in smartphone camera to scan the QR code. It sends a text message to a toll-free number 1922. And the checking records, a quarter billion has been sent so far, are created and stored with no need, again, of an app download. And only when necessary do the contact tracers retrieve the data, piece together the puzzle of the multiple security stored and privacy preserving pieces into uh, effective contact tracing. So we reduce the time it takes for an average case of more than 24 hours into less than 24 minutes. And the system was deployed to millions of venues within just three days. And this would not be possible without a robust partnership between the social sector, the public sector, and the private sector. Uh, and when we talk about private sector, I want to especially thank the Line Corporation uh, from Japan for agreeing to use, to change their code to use the main QR code scanner of adding Line friends uh, to contribute to 1922 SMS, which doubtlessly uh, contribute to the popularity so um, to, to conclude, I think the mask rationing map, the vaccine reservation system and the contact tracing system that I introduced is just some of the ideas that we can learn by trusting the citizens, much like how the tip of Taiwan, the Yushan Jade Mountain, raises two or three centimeters each year because precisely of earthquakes from the clash and tectonic place. If we have a resilient democratic infrastructure to invite innovations from completely different ends of the spectrum, from the social sector, charities, uh, social innovators, but also large corporations, companies, and so on, then when we come to the same virtual table to discuss, we can also co-create our way through resilience to a better digitally enabled social infrastructure. And that's my opening remark. Thank you for listening.
end of speech? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have welcomed Minister Audrey, who is very busy, and uh, it was a very valuable time shared with us. Thank you very much. We appreciate it so much. Thank you. And uh, uh, Mr. Audrey is very busy and don't have time to sleep. How many hours do you sleep a day? Uh, eight hours, always more than eight hours. Uh, if I get very busy, that is to say, if I have to think uh, beyond the existing positions of which there are many, then I work over time. I sleep for nine hours or 10 hours at most uh, because I really do the creative work in my sleep. Uh, and which is why I believe that uh, the resilience also of the, our internal mindset of accepting that better solutions exist, of overcoming the not invented here syndrome uh, rests in sufficient rest. Because if we do not have sufficient sleep, ample sleep, then we tend to continue whatever habits of solution that we were used to, uh, business as usual. Uh, in the previous day. But when I have sufficient amount of sleep, I always uh, wake up uh, with some new ideas that's incorporated by listening attentively to various other people across various other sectors in the previous day. So I often say that sleep is the time that I actually do my work. Um, and so uh, just a, um, a procedural uh, feedback. Um, I, I cut the opening remark short, not because I have to run, I have nothing for the next hour, but because I want to uh, focus more on the real-time question and answers uh, and in the panel and with the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, we can sleep eight, more than eight hours. It is very surprising that you can sleep. You are expert in uh, time management, I guess. Now get into the topic of today. Uh, today we welcome each panelist and raise the six topics to cover today. And to each, uh, their relative topics uh, to each. Topic first, number two is uh, the time of disaster like tsunami how the government should deal with it and respond to it and prepare for it. Uh, looking back the looking back the past experience, we'd like to talk about it with each other, with uh, Dr. Imamura and Dr. Garia, uh, introducing uh, research results of each gentleman. I would like to have a comment from uh, Minister Audrey on those two gentlemen's uh, results. First, Imamura-san, please. <laughs> Dr. Imamura. We cannot uh, hear Dr. Imamura's voice. Please use the microphone on Teams. Hey. Cannot hey. to hear you. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, fine. Now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tan. And Professor Gallia is here, and uh, I'm very looking forward to having discussions with you. I'm uh, at uh, Tokyo University studying on earthquake and tsunami, and nine years ago, the big earthquake happened. And uh, going forward, Today, we'd like to talk about these important issues together. Let me share the document. Yes, looks fine. This is the when the big earthquake broke out, the tsunami images. 
when it happened. On the left, the five minutes after the outbreak at Hokkaido, Tohoku, and coastal area. And 20 minutes later, it's the image in the middle, propagated to the coastal areas. And then 30 minutes later, as on the right, big 30 me meters high tidal wave, uh, tsunami wave happened. And uh, in the coastal area, there came a very big stream. In the past, uh, this area had a big tsunami. And there's a protective uh, bank. There was a protective bank, but it was totally broken. So big uh, disaster was brought. In order to protect the lives of people, from tsunami, there's a warning system. Uh, Japan has 60 years of a history of a tsunami warning system. When earthquake happens, within one minute, we give out the warning with what magnitude, what level of magnitude and locations it happened. If it's in the sea, magnitude of seven or higher, then there is a chance of tsunami. So tsunami switch quickly to tsunami warning. And in 33 minutes, it ends, the warning ends. So within three minutes, information comes. So 2011, yeah, information came on at that day. On the left is uh, uh, 1449, three minutes after the outbreak, the first warning came. In Miyagi, six meters, Fukushima, three meters. But actual wave was, came, went up to 30 meters. Why this has so much gap? The first uh, came the underestimation. Within one minute, the magnitude was uh, seven, but in reality, nine hundred. It was underestimated by 100 times in terms of energy, so unfortunately the forecast was not good enough. But in this area, as is on the right bottom, there's a, there's a GPS sensor attached in the location and catch the tsunami. The first wave came around three o'clock with the height of six meters, but the off coast offshore is this much. But as it gets closer, it gets higher. So it already passed uh, 18 meters. So as a result, at the 1514, came up to six meters six meters and the information updated the information has become updated as time goes and the accuracy was good but at that time the first wave of tsunami already came arrived so it was too late to evacuate so what it means what it tells us is that uh, the information immediately after the break is difficult to obtain. And uh, so quick information needs to be captured. And uh, as we analyze more and more, the accuracy becomes better. But as time passes, the, it, it is very difficult to evacuate. So there comes a trade-off. So we have to understand the reality very clearly, but and have come have to come up with the countermeasures like this. That was a big lesson learned. So in order to, uh, I would like you to understand the situation. That was all from my side at the first topic. Next, uh, we'd like to welcome Mr. Garia. Please. So, Professor Garia, please.
Thank you very much. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here. I only wish I could be in Tokyo with you in person. Um, as Tokyo is one of my favorite places in the world, and um, the, the people and friends uh, from 4 and 8 uh, uh, are very dear to me. So I wish I was there with you, but uh, uh, technology allows us to communicate in this way, which is, I think, uh, very useful. And uh, I was very impressed with Audrey Tang understanding that uh, she gets eight hours sleep and does the most creative thinking in the sleep. That's fantastic. Uh, right now, it's um, 1.30 in the morning here in London, and so I'm suffering from lack of sleep. Um, so maybe my brain is a little bit slow and not as creative as it should be. Um, but uh, it, it was very interesting uh, uh, presentation. And I think when we're talking about um, natural disasters, or in fact, any disaster, um, I like to keep in mind a, a proverb, a very wise proverb, um, that chance favors the prepared mind. And so um, the way we enhance our resilience to natural disasters is through planning, robust planning. Uh, and, and, and as part of that planning, that includes the education and training uh, of the population. Uh, and through the planning, uh, we have to take into consideration, um, uh, or we can uh, use simulation to, uh, to help us create robust plans. Um, but it's very important to also understand, and this is something that often engineers and technologists often overlook and forget, is that the public does not necessarily respond the way the engineer or the technologist or the government official would like. And so we have to understand the human dimension and the way humans are likely to respond to these uh, natural disasters uh, if our plans are going to be sufficiently robust uh, to accommodate uh, these, sorts of, um, these sorts of issues. So this is where uh, a lot of my work comes in, understanding the psychology of um, human response in disaster situations and understanding um, uh, uh, the nature of the behavioral response and how we can include that in our planning and simulation. So I think that's a, that's key. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Well, I think it's a uh, uh, that those disasters we never uh, anticipate when that happens. So it's just like a trade-off issue. We have no time to think about. So we have to be prepared uh, mentally. It's very important. And one more point is uh, now everything doesn't go like we thought. So for this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic is the same too. It started last year and uh, uh, in Japan, the masks are very popular. So everyone purchased those masks. And in Japan, we are trying to provide those masks and, and the, that's the same on uh, Minister Audley, too. You are actively participating in that, and you are uh, doing very well. So would you please give me your uh, idea how to protect them? Yes. Um, the mask rationing map, of course, um, is well known in Japan is based on what we call a public infrastructure in the digital realm or digital public infrastructure uh, that already was built before the pandemic based on the air quality measurements from the middle schools, primary schools, and so on into a distributed ledger maintained by our National Academy and held by our National Center of High-Speed Computation. And it's part of our educational effort so that the students are not just learning about media literacy or data literacy, but rather media and digital competence. 
Literacy is when we just consume information. Competence is when we remix and make information for the public good. So the primary schoolers that measures air quality like two, uh, PM 2.5 in their schoolyard or back at home with open hardware in their balcony all contribute to, for example, their neighbors and their family members before they go to job will actually check the air quality level before they go. And that data came from the student curation rated uh, data steward um, device, the, the Airbox. And the Civil IoT system that uh, the Airbox is one part of provides the kind of trust-based infrastructure so people can write to this distributed ledger while not uh, worrying about the cybersecurity, the disinformation, the trolls, and so on that uh, pollutes more antisocial corners of social media. And it's thanks to this mutual accountability mechanism, can we build the mask rationing map uh, in just three days, again, from the help of Gov Zero people, as well as also extend that, for example, to the earthquake uh, monitoring system uh, that has this hybrid platform on the simulation rooms, but also, again, in the K-12 school campuses, um, science parks, firefighting departments, kindergartens, and so on, so that people can not just participate in the drills, but also participate in how to get those warnings and reduce the time it takes from earthquake being detected to actual evacuation instructions uh, with the people, not just from the government designing for the people. And it was really successful. Um, in just a few years, like four years time of the civil IOT, we have uh, reduced uh, the warning alerts through this hybrid fashion previously is close to 20 seconds and now it's issued in less than 10 seconds after the shaking is detected uh, thanks to this hybrid collaboration. Uh, so that's uh, end of my remarks. Thank you. Yeah, I understand now I have to say it. Thank you. So as you just mentioned, believe trust in infrastructure. You just said four years ago there came a warning system. So as a result, the people could evacuate smoothly, uh, move smoothly because of that. Dr. Imamura, uh, uh, this is related to topic three and four. In order for even one more people to be able to evacuate it and be safe, what can we do? Uh, people, what should be prepared? And the trustworthy infrastructure should be built as well. From your past experience of the tsunami, what uh, should uh, Japan do or Japan is doing? Could you tell us some examples, experience? Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. In order to cope with the disaster, incident well in advance, we need uh, preparation, like uh, education, meaning that to the children, yeah, so education is very important. So I'd like to introduce education system in Japan. There is uh, evacuation. So here it's uh, led by students. The elementary school students actually, when the warning happened, elementary school students themselves led the group and uh, supported by themselves, amongst themselves, at the time of earthquake and tsunami. So learn about the past history of tsunami and do the drill, and doing the drill, and uh, ran up to the high place and was safe. So there's even a designated place had a big tsunami 
But with the gathering and second tsunami also came. So understand the students understood the information in a correct manner at that time. Though we have a lot of casualties, but students themselves led the group to help them evacuate. So it was a very good uh, example in Japan. Thank you very much. Uh, that is a uh, disaster education to the children, save the adults, because of so many experience in that area. So by teaching students, we could avoid the disaster. So, Audrey-san in Taiwan, how about the education in Taiwan to school students? As I mentioned, uh, data competence is something that's almost impossible to teach, but very easy to learn. Uh, once you operate one of those air boxes and so on. And the community have also moved on to water boxes, which measures the water pollution level and link it to the agricultural studies so that people can understand uh, the water that they're drinking, how exactly did they flow, and learn important points about conserving not just uh, everyday water resources, but also actively inventing uh, in the water system and so on. Again, this um, in, um, this idea of making a collaborative ledger of the environment around us is preparing our students uh, for an even more complex system like greenhouse gas accounting, which is very important if we are to plan the carbon sinks, the uh, planting uh, areas together and maintain them as a community. So it, it's like the training wheels uh, that people can, uh, in their primary school, uh, first learn about um, air quality, water quality and so on, and then gradually about the complex interplay uh, with the atmospheric and other environmental systems. I want to also highlight uh, that the participatory nature of it. Um, there's a popular app uh, inspired actually by a uh, Japanese uh, invention, I believe it's called Maimitsu, uh, which shows the drinking fountains uh, near the school. Uh, but in Taiwan, the civic technologists extended that into a Pokemon Go-like game where children can collect coins uh, for checking in to learn about the local histories and local environments, just like Pokemon Go, uh, by bringing their bottles and refill at those fountains. And it also pushes um, the notifications whenever they detect that their uh, local heat uh, damage may occur out of the wind and the uh, sun's angle and so on, so that people can uh, learn to evacuate a little bit uh, from the heat and, and drinking plenty of water. So none of this is particularly disastrous, uh, but making this uh, coordinated action and notification and contribution a habit in a participatory way prepares us for the larger disasters in the future. Thank you. So that's the remark. Yeah. With the participatory type of application teaches you, right? Well, I was impressed by listening to your experience. By enjoying, uh, kids can learn. How about uh, Mr. Gadia, Professor Gadia? Uh, in the yeah. earlier, I, I, I'd like to ask you about the, there are some. Uh, at the time of a uh, fire disaster, uh, you have the experience in that evacuation from your past experience, countermeasures and uh, preparation, and uh, what is the point that you're focusing on and what is improving in your study in those areas? Well, I mean, there's. Let me let me jump back a little bit before I address that question. Because I think there was a lot of interesting discussion just uh, just now, and I want to go back to a couple of things. Uh, and some of this I'll be bringing up in my talk later on. Um, but uh, the issue of mask wearing, for example, really very important, and a very simple mitigation uh, process that can be very very effective. But in the West, 
um, we really made a mess of mask wearing. And I think this is one of the reasons we had such a high death rate from COVID, at least early in the pandemic. And the problem was that um, uh, the, the messaging from the government, from, from, the, from our political leaders and their scientific advisors, uh, was that uh, mask wearing was actually useless, pointless. And in fact, the messaging was that mask wearing is actually counterproductive and dangerous. And this was, this was in the face of the evidence before our very eyes of what was happening in Taiwan, in Japan, and in Korea, where people were wearing masks and it was proving very, very effective. And then, and then this led to, and then when the government changed their mind and started to recommend mask wearing, um, we then had the fake news um, uh, uh, phenomena where people were starting to write in, uh, um, you know, that uh, masks are, are bad, don't wear them. The government said first they were bad, now they're saying they're good, we can't trust the government. So the messaging becomes very, very important and understanding uh, the evidence base becomes very, very important. And really government should, and government advisors should really take into account the evidence base, not just from your local experts, but be prepared to look beyond your borders. Look what your neighbors are doing. Look what other citizens around the world are doing. What's the experience? What can we learn from all these other cultures and societies uh, that have faced uh, not only the, the current crisis, but similar crises in the past that we should be learning from. So this is very, very important, I think. And it's something that uh, certainly Western governments and certainly the government in the UK and in the United States failed dismally uh, in the early parts of the pandemic. Um, the, the other point that was interesting is the uh, uh, point about alarms and having uh, uh, this is something that we have in, 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 in the fire safety uh, arena is having an alarm. But an alarm is useless if people don't understand the message of the alarm. And so the alarm has to be simple and people have to become familiar with the message of the alarm. Uh, if they don't understand what the alarm is, they will waste precious time wondering, oh, what does that sound? What does that mean? Is that So for example, if you have a tsunami alarm, what the hell is a tsunami alarm? What does that mean? What does it sound like? What's the message it's telling me? If I'm a tourist in your city and a tsunami alarm goes off, I'm going to say, well, what is that? I've never heard it before. And so you're going to create potential confusion. And this is where the training uh, comes in and the education comes in. You need to inform and educate and train people how to respond. Similarly with signage. I've seen wonderful signage um, cropping up all around the world for tsunami. Now, you have a nice tsunami wave and a sign for it. What does that sign mean to the uninformed? Does that mean that's the direction of the surf beach? If you want to go and see the surf, go in that direction. Does that, is that what it means? Or does it mean there's a place of safety from the tsunami? Okay, so the comprehensibility of your message to the public. And again, this is the point I made earlier on. It's important that technologists and governments don't assume that the public understand your message. Uh, you need to measure that understandability. Okay, and, and we have this issue with emergency signage for fire and evacuation. Uh, lots of new concepts being developed like dynamic signage. Again, I'll be talking about this in my presentation. But do people actually comprehend and understand what these dynamic signage messages mean? And, and so do they react appropriately? So this is really very important to understand the human side of, of all of these technological um, solutions. And, and uh, training, um, uh, I think it was an issue that was raised um, uh, later, uh, uh, a few minutes ago, about the importance of training children and uh, ed educating children. This is really vital. And we've seen this in history um, in lots of cases um, where uh, 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 important training of youngsters um, can actually make a big difference in the outcomes in um, uh, 
in, 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 um, in disasters. This isn't rocket science. We've got lots of very good evidence of this. Uh, so, for, for example, during the Second World War um, in the UK, uh, children in primary, elementary school were trained how to put on the gas mask. Okay. So it wasn't we were just expecting the adults to know how to do this and then the adults will take care of the children. We taught the children how to do this. And in fact, the children taught the adults um, uh, how to respond. So uh, th that's a simple example from the 1930s uh, of how important it is to, to educate children. Another example more recently is children at school, certainly in the UK, are being taught first aid and uh, the importance of identifying, underst understanding if, for example, uh, an adult has collapsed, what to do, you know, call 999 in the UK. Uh, and, and this has saved a number of lives um, through the education of children um, as early as elementary school. So all of these things are, are really very, very important. And the, the sooner we uh, begin to um, educate and inform uh, the, uh, the youngsters, the, the, the more resilient a society um, uh, we, we, we will have. Um, I think, uh, I'm not sure if I've answered uh, <laughs> or address the point that was made to me. I can't remember what that point was. Um, so perhaps perhaps I finish for now, unless there's another question or discussion for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As I heard Dr. Garia communicate the correct information, like the meaning of alarm, what it all means, the sound, and also learn from the children like gas mask example, taught uh, children, then children taught uh, parents. And like uh, Dr. Imamura said, at, at the time of evacuation, uh, pupils led the tsunami evacuation. Yes, yeah, so education involved children to help uh, evacuate and prepare for the disaster. That is very significant. And uh, uh, Audrey San, do you have a lot of interviews with the children and the communication with the children, right? I heard, I've read the article. And in that, what you can learn from children, if you have any comments of, on that, what do you learn from co children? Yeah, just after this talk, I'm going to visit the Dunhua Middle School uh, for a conversation. So indeed, uh, it's my uh, job as the minister in charge of youth engagement to engage the youth as early as possible. Uh, and what we have learned is that the younger people, the people younger than 18, people before they get the voting right, really, are actually much more passionate about the innovative solutions when it comes to environmental and disaster mitigation and things like that. They're also very well connected internationally. All they lack is a stage for their innovations to be taken seriously because they don't have a vote, right? They can't uh, vote themselves in. So uh, in Taiwan, we have this national platform where people can raise citizen initiatives. And after collecting 5,000 signatures online from citizen or residents, anyone with a SMS number, really, um, we must respond from a ministry of positions. And if it's interagency, I personally collaborate with uh, the social sector twice a month. Now, the point is that more than a quarter of those initiatives are proposed by people younger than 18. So they are the most active age segments. They came up with this idea of banning plastic straws from the taking out of our national drink, the bubble tea, uh, replacing it with circular material or reusable material and actually charted out a transitioning plan with the business sector and so on. And with this um, joint platform, their idea became reality in just a few months. So these are just some of the idea of reverse mentorship. If we give them the stage, they actually connect much better to the senior generation. People who are uh, 17 years old are the perfect partner of people who are 70 
years old because those age groups have more time on their hands, care more about the long term, and also organize passionately in the social sector. So that's our experience in just touring around Taiwan to listen to the middle schoolers, what they feel, what they think when they complete their data competence education, when they fact check the presidential candidates to put an end to this information, uh, when they uh, fact check the local weather stations, right? And things like that, what else would they like to do? And that's when I learned the most. Thank you very much. Uh, children under uh, the 18 doesn't, who, who doesn't have uh, any voting uh, right. Uh, so you are uh, working, focusing on those uh, age area. Uh, this uh, is due uh, because, because due to the di digital era, uh, that will be very important. Uh, I have about uh, on, uh, eight minutes. I would like to ask you the question. This uh, is uh, from the person who is engaged in the civil engineering area in Japan. Uh, now we are doing to promote uh, the uh, digital uh, system. Uh, is in that one, uh, uh, because, uh, from your experience, uh, would you please uh, help us uh, and tell me where we have to focus on, uh, on for the, the digital situation? Yeah, um, as I mentioned, the focus should be on trusting the citizens to come up with innovations rather than working for the citizens. We need to work with the citizens. And the key idea of nothing about us without us tells us when we design, for example, the contact tracing system, the mask rationing system, we work together with the frontline pharmacists, with the senior people who don't want to use an ATM to wire anything out because to them it's too dangerous. They use the ATM only to withdraw cash and they prefer to pay in cash and so on. We need to let them come up with the models that we deliver those digital services so that even in convenience store in Taiwan, for example, um, you still use the national health card without entering password or involving money to pre-order the mask and then you pay cash at a counter. Of course, you can also pay using mobile payment. But the point is that if the senior people, if the people who are disadvantaged actually come up with the solution themselves and you implement them to augment existing solutions, they become passionate opinion leaders that because they co-invented it will convince everyone in their community how to enroll into this. And for example, when we did vaccine reservation, people over the age of 65 overwhelmingly said they don't want to pre-register because they have a lot of free time on their hands. Just tell them uh, when and where to go. They will just go there, saving one extra transaction of appointments. But people of the working age, of course, they have to take a days of work and so on. They prefer to schedule by their own volition. So in Taiwan, uh, over 65 years old of people do not have to register for vaccines. It's appointed directly, but people under 64 uh, have to register, but they can do so with the help of local district officer to their local pharmacy, with a local convenience store, or just calling a local support line. So it's very diversified. And the reason why we take such diversified way to deliver the public services is because these are created by the people. Those innovations are by the people themselves closest to the pain. We just empower them. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank you very much. The elderly people have difficulty using uh, registration system, but uh, trust uh, citizens and work together. That is very important. Like uh, with the age, in the age of SNS, this can be possible. Uh, sorry, we are running out of time. We have only four minutes left. Lastly, we'd I'd like to have uh, uh, Dr. Imamura, uh, Dr. Gary, uh, Dr. Tang. One short uh, comment from each gentleman. Dr. Imamura, please. Thank you very much. 
の今回の。There are some areas that people do not、uh, follow exactly, so double check on the facts with the government and the citizens is important. And if it is effective,、uh, we need to take actions if people find it's effective. So actions or many measures need to be taken, and、uh, maybe we should make a standard internationally to work. And by sharing the experience from many people from many parts of the world, that would be great. Thank you very much for sharing information today.、Uh, Dr. Garia?、Uh, th thanks very much.、Uh, it's been, look, it's been a very interesting discussion.、Um, and uh, I think I I'll just finish up by saying I think the public is often viewed as part of the problem. And in fact, the public is part of the solution.、Uh, in most cases, in most disasters, the first responders are not the official police and the firefight, they are the public. And so we have to trust the public、uh, to react and to build our resilience. And to do that, we need to educate, train, and provide the information and listen to what the public is telling us. Uh, about how they will, are likely to respond. We have to listen to that and take that into account in our planning.、Uh, so, just to finish off with what I started off saying, chance favors the prepared mind. Uh, and uh, that's something I, I, that's a motto I live by, and, 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 I, and I wish society would do the same. Thank you very much. So, let's go to the last one, Audrey. 一言最後のメッセージをお願いします。Uh, okay, the old tree said the last message, please. Sure.、Um, yeah, I, I would like also to echo、uh, what Dr. Galia has said.、Uh, I think in Taiwan, the mask wearing、uh, communication was so effective precisely because it's not、uh, based on something that's top down, that's scholarly or、uh, sounds professional.、Uh, it's from a very cute spokesdog, <laughs> Shiba Inu, actually, that we、uh, invited people to remix. We just put this very cute、uh, message of a Shiba Inu, the spokesdog, putting the food to their mouth、uh, and uh, saying no.、Uh, but the message around that particular picture, people, including children, are free to innovate. And we just、uh, look at what was really popular back then is this message wear a mask to prevent you from touching your own face with your unwashed hand. And, and that is so beautiful because at the time, the scientific evidence. Of masks' use uh, in uh, preventing the virus is still being gathered. But this message, of course, everyone can、uh, verify for themselves, right? It's a reminder of hand washing, essentially.、Um, and so, by basing on things that、uh, adult people or professional people would simply not look at, right, would simply ignore, and taking the children's perspective,、uh, we actually massively popularized that message and measured the hand wash water use in the waterways.、Uh, in The water system、uh, in, in Taiwan, and it really did、uh, result in longer hand washing time as well as mask use. So, this simple anecdote, I believe, is one of the ideas、uh, that is so important when we look at the people public private partnerships where the people, ordinary citizens, come up with these ideas and norms and so on. And the public sector, far from fighting them, just amplify them, and the private sector help. To scale it out and scale it up. Thank you. That's my contribution. It's a really nice panel. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. So,、um, Japan, um, the, the government uh, distributed uh, two masks uh, per head, uh, but the,、uh, we should have listened to the voice of the children like you did in Taiwan. Then it could have been a cooler design. <laughs> anyway,、um, well, thank you very much. And、um, yeah, we'd like to have to say goodbye and a big round of applause to、uh, Audrey Tan.、Uh, Minister Tan, thank you so much today. Thank you.